tell you some more of the stories behind my pictures. Uh, one day late in 1977, Bruce Bernard, the legendary picture editor of the Sunday Times Colour magazine, rang me up and said, uh, uh, Hey Richard, do you want to walk round a hill? I said, You know me, Bruce, I'll do anything. <laughs> uh, he said, It's called Annapurna. Annapurna, as it happens, uh, is the deadliest mountain of them all. 40% uh, of the people who've attempted to climb it have uh, lost their lives. But we weren't going to climb it, we were just going to walk around it, so that didn't matter. I flew to Kathmandu, where I met the rest of the trekkers who were going to be going around the mountain. In the front left of this uh, picture is a is Babalal, who's a porter who was um, especially assigned to take care of me and, and my photographic equipment so that I could travel quickly and um, get ahead of the other people and hang around and take pictures of them going and overtake them and, um, and move independently. This was something of an honour for uh, Babalal really because he'd been singled out for special duties. We drove by Jeep uh, to the start of our trek which was the lowlands leading up into the Manang Valley and um, almost straight away people were stopping work in the fields and, uh, and looking at us. I don't think I met anyone there that didn't have a smile and the water buffalo <laughs> were unimpressed. But the land was very fertile and very warm and um, quite lush really and there were magical horses around the place sometimes as, as pack animals they seemed to be on their own nobody was leading them or driving them or anything they just they would just be you know, coming down the path towards you and um, they weren't going to give way and uh, there didn't appear to be anybody with them half the time but some were for riding and they had a magical quality about them very small the only thing up there is subsistence farming, really. And I think the farming is, uh, was really, really difficult. But the people, absolutely beautiful. Everywhere we went, they smiled and greeted us with namaste and looked intrigued by us. This was the bank down in the lowlands. The, the windows are quite interesting for a bank, I thought. <laughs> This was a tea house on the on the side of the road where we'd stop for this sort of hot, sweet tea. This was Babalal, my porter. He's uh, smoking a, a biri, I think. Uh, biri is a, is a single leaf of tobacco which is rolled into a into a cone shape and tied with a piece of cotton. Um, I got quite used to them after a while. But whilst we're talking about Babalal, I will just explain that during one day's particularly hard climb, we, uh, we went up about 3,000 feet after breakfast. Um, Babalal noticed that I hadn't got my umbrella, which was a, a 50 pence umbrella I bought in Kathmandu to keep the sun off. I told him it didn't matter. I told him I didn't use it anyway. An umbrella's no good to a photography. You need your hands on your cameras. Um, but he would have none of it. It was his responsibility. And uh, it had taken us three hours to go up the 3,000 feet. But he ran down, found the umbrella, and ran back up uh, in about an hour. It was a matter of honour for him. And I must say, uh, he, he left a, a lasting impression with me, really. Um, I think he was the most honest, one of the most honest and honourable men I ever met in my life. And I'm privileged to have met him. Again, magical horses. This is a pregnant mare and a dried riverbed. The Kalagandaki is the river and this is the dried riverbed from from high up looking down at uh, two or three yaks and, uh, and a couple of people. The roads get quite interesting the higher up you get and the bridges are uh, quite a feat of engineering um, given that they haven't got any long timber. This one is a very interesting construction really. Um, they haven't got any wood that's long enough, so they come up with ingenious solutions to make the bridges. As you go up uh, into the into the foothills and go to different altitudes and different villages, uh, there's a, an architectural style about each village, really, each area. Depends, I'm sure, on the 
raw materials that are at hand. But everywhere you go, you see the nobility of the of the people living. I suppose in what we think is a hardship, but not complaining about it. Everywhere, wonderful people. I think out of all of the wonderful views and landscapes in Nepal, the most beautiful thing there is the people. And as you climb higher, the vegetation gets more sparse and the mountains start to appear above the foothills and they, uh, they draw you towards them. It's very hard living out there. And there is a lot of, a lot of poverty. It's hard work, it's medieval. It truly is medieval. And the poverty, as always, shows itself in the very young and the old. But there's no, there's no resentment there. The, the poverty doesn't sort of equate to misery somehow, as it seems to in other parts of the world. Climbing higher still, the architecture and the materials used changes. But when you get over about 12,000 feet, certainly I started to have some very, very strange dreams. At night I would, uh, I would have, I think, what you would call a lucid dream. It was um, uh, extremely detailed about somewhere I'd never seen before. And the next day I would go there in reality. I don't know how that works, but for three days in a row I had these very, very strange dreams. Higher and higher, and then you look down and see these little green jewels of fertile land at the base of the hills where, where there's a stream and over centuries they've built up the fertility of it with animal dung and, and, and just farming and uh, recycling and always these beautiful colourful people. Uh, it, it's the guy that rides the horse and uh, it seems his wife just gets to hold on to the horse's tail. But uh, lovely people without resentment and very colourful. We're starting to come up into the high deserts near to near to Mustang, which is uh, somewhere we couldn't go. Um, it wasn't part of our trek anyway, but Mustang was closed at that time uh, because apparently there were bandits out there, which is hard to imagine because the people seem so, so wonderful, so lovely, friendly. Here, this little village, you can see the Himalayan silver birches. They're the only thing that'll grow up there, the only trees that'll grow up there. And they don't grow very big at that altitude. But it's their only source of fuel for their fires apart from animal dung. The only trees they have for construction as well. Farming on the roof of the world, this is up at about 13,000 feet, I think, uh, with an ox ploughing this uh, tiny little field. Then up to a place called Tamung Meadow, which is at 15,000 feet. Um, this lady is a Tibetan refugee. There are a lot of Tibetan refugees up in that part of the world. She's absolutely charming and she made us some rancid yak butter tea, which um, I can assure you tasted as good as it sounds. <laughs> but you have to be polite and drink it and, uh, and say thank you. We camped up there for a day as acclimatization and I took um, a, a day hike across a little stream. There were a couple of other people who went as well, but they went a different um, way when we got across the stream. I went up and they went down and it was about here that I am ashamed to say I missed a picture of uh, a snow leopard. He'd been watching me for some time I think as I was climbing up this uh, loose rock and uh, I didn't see him so well camouflaged until he moved. He moved a little bit and I saw him uh, watching me for a split second and then he turned and, and went away around the corner and uh, with this massive tail behind him. You know, I, I started to run after him but at, at 15,000 feet you can't run very far <laughs> uphill <laughs> and uh, that was without thinking what on earth I was going to do if I caught him. <laughs> so uh, I have to live with the fact I didn't get it. But I, I did see him for uh, two or three seconds and, uh, and that was a privilege to see such a rare animal. The next thing that happened was that when I went back to camp or was trying to get back to camp, the tiny little stream that I'd hopped over on the way to uh, my day trip 
um, had swollen into a 20 foot wide river screaming past at 30 miles an hour. It was frankly impossible for one person on their own. And so the, uh, the porters and uh, Sherpas made a human chain which went sort of halfway across the river and I had to make a couple of, um, couple of big jumps onto boulders and rocks and it was actually a bit of a scramble to get back and um, really the truth is nobody had warned me but that little stream in the morning by the time the sun has been on the glaciers and the sun has been on the snow and started to melt it the melt waters swell it out of all recognition anyway all's well ends well <laughs> so we climbed higher and higher up towards uh, a place called Thoronglā which is uh, it means high pass and it's, uh, it's actually the lowest point between two mountains and it's um, 17,770 feet at the lowest point. The other thing is if you are daft enough to try to smoke at high altitude, <laughs> which of course I was, um, it's very very hard to light your cigarette or in my case little berries, these, uh, these single leaf, rolled leaf. Um, the only way you can light it is to suck like mad whilst the match head is actually flaring because there isn't enough oxygen for the match to set fire to the wood. Um, <laughs> I was told by the doctor on the trip that being a smoker uh, had done me no harm as far as the trip was concerned because um, smokers automatically build up a higher number of red blood corpuscles which uh, are the ones that carry the oxygen around the bloodstream and to the brain and everywhere. You know, having more red blood corpuscles is a distinct advantage at high altitude. But the air was very, very thin there and um, started to have some very strange effects, more strange effects on your, on your body and on your mind. We um, explored a little bit when we got there, set up camp. There were only six of us that were fit enough to stay there. The rest had developed colds and uh, were considered to be in danger of, uh, of having pulmonary edema or, or uh, perhaps cerebral edema. Anyway, they moved straight on through Thoronglā and down 5,000 feet on the other side, whereas we stayed and camped. This was the scene first thing in the morning. We went to bed that night, uh, six of us in a two-man tent. It was all pretty cosy really. We went to sleep about six o'clock, woke up in the morning uh, to find that it was seven o'clock the same evening. That night seemed to last two weeks to me. I don't know what happened to the perception of time. It was completely and utterly distorted. In the morning it probably only took half an hour to get my boots on but it seemed like two hours um, and was so laborious, very hard work and I started to realise how much determination mountaineers and high altitude explorers must have had just to persevere higher and higher when every every part of your body is saying oh I can't be bothered <laughs> still it's there are inspiring sights to say the very least after spending the morning exploring and uh, climbing a little bit at the side of the pass so that I could get some pictures looking down, we packed up and went down 5,000 feet in one, in one hit um, in the afternoon down into the Pokhara Valley. The first thing we saw was a, a little tea house. Well, it was actually more of a pub than a tea house made from an old silk parachute they were drinking rukshi and chang, which uh, local homemade alcohol. It didn't taste too good, but it, it did the job. Uh, and there was this little guy spinning yak wool into, into thread. And then we went back to Kathmandu and uh, spent a day there, had a bit of a party and uh, split up and went home. The first thing I did when I got back to London was put my film in for processing. It was Kodachrome, so it took 24 hours to process. And the next thing I did was go to the pub, my local pub, which was the, the French house in Dean Street. And I had a glass of wine with a couple of friends of mine in there. And I was halfway through the second glass of wine. 
and I heard these angels singing, and I hit the floor. Well, it happened that one of the one of my friends had a, a, a son who had a friend who'd come back from Nepal and suddenly died two days later, and the other friend had a Range Rover, which was parked right outside the French house. So the next thing I knew, I was waking up in the Tropical Diseases Hospital um, in North London in borrowed pyjamas. And it's a very difficult place to get out of. They won't let you go. And uh, I told them I'd got 40 rolls of film with 36 shots in each that I had to edit and uh, deliver to the Sunday Times on Monday morning. And uh, eventually I persuaded them to let me go on the basis that I would take them a, a sample um, every day, uh, which I said I would. And um, in fact, I'm still on their missing persons list, <laughs> as it happens. I hope you've enjoyed today's story. Uh, if you have, uh, remember to like it, subscribe if you haven't already, and tell your friends. Next time, I'll tell you what happened when I went flying with Wing Commander Wallace and his homemade autogyro. Thank you.